Hello, Booktube. I thought we'd do another grab and gab anti tag. Uh, this was created originally by Sean the Book Maniac, who uh, conceived of a tag that wasn't structured at all. You just grab 10 books off your shelf and waffle about them. <laughs> uh, but I thought that 10 was a bit much. Uh, and I have a tendency to waffle anyway, so I narrowed it down to five and renamed it, of course, because everyone in the world, on Booktube, in publishing, everywhere, should take advantage of Steve's titling ability at all times. <laughs> so this is the grab and gab tag. Uh, and the reason that I'm, uh, that I'm crouched over is because I'm down in puppy territory uh, to grab the first one. We'll grab five books and we'll chat about them just a bit. Uh, and I'm down at the bottom shelf here, which... Uh, is a place that sort of collected fiction from this year. Uh, oh, 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 we saw this on this channel. The Last Laugh by Lynn Freed. What a wonderful book. Oh, what a wonderful novel. Thin little thing. Uh, a, modern, a modern take on An Enchanted April uh, where, where three uh, self-professed old bags, <laughs> three old ladies, uh, they're not really that old. They decide that they've done their duty for king and country. They've had families and husbands and children and whatnot. They've, they've done it all, and now they want to retire and just indulge themselves. <laughs> they want to retire to a little island, a little resort, and just indulge themselves in the freedom from responsibility that they've always dreamed about. But, of course, it, it doesn't work that way. And, you know, that's an enchanting enough premise on its own, but the Lynn Freed's writing is so wonderful. Every line is crystal. I just, oh, I loved it. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. We're down in our territory, and she knows it. Oh, God. I'm talking to my lame-ass booktube friends, little girl, if you don't mind. Ooh. All right, so what else have we got here? Uh, should we move on from this shelf? Out of puppy territory. Hmm? Should we? Let's see. Let's move on somewhere else. Oh, okay. We're still in puppy territory, as you can see, because she's batting at the camera. She can't, can't stand not to be the center of attention. Uh, all right, you cut it out. We have a, a graphic novel and a very old one, too. This is Bring On the Bad Guys by Stan Lee. Uh, this is the third in his, uh, in his, when he was pioneering the idea of a paperback full of comic book reprints, a, a book that would actually be in bookstores. This was, uh, well, it doesn't say on the cover, but, the, oh yeah, this was six ninety five, which was a lot of money <laughs> for, for a comic book collection at the time, especially when Marvel was running reprint uh, series for 25 cents a piece on the stands every month. But look at that. Look at that John Romita Sr. cover. Isn't that beautiful? You have the abomination in the background. And the Green Goblin, and the Red Skull, and Loki, and Dormammu, and Mephisto, and Doctor Doom. Notice the prevalence of green uh, <laughs> on the, uh, in the, the villains. Uh, and this is just a reprint. Uh, it's a collection of reprints of the, the great Marvel villains, uh, some of their earlier appearances. And it's just, <laughs> I, I love it, which is why I've never gotten rid of it. Uh, oh, here we go. Oh, look at this. Oh, this was quite the find. This is The Wars of Justinian. By Procopius, and you know, you know that a translator has his pretentious hat on when he spells Procopius with a K. <laughs> Procopius was a, a, a Byzantine uh, Roman historian who's famous for uh, the secret history. He was a, a high-ranking functionary in the government of Emperor Justinian, the, his wife Theodora, the, their their great general, uh, uh, the emperor. Uh, <laughs> he was he was uh, a high functionary for uh, Belisarius, and the, who was the great general of the Emperor Justinian. And he knew Belisarius. He knew Belisarius's wife. He knew uh, the Emperor Justinian. He knew Theodora, his his uh, infamous wife. And he wrote dutifully about them uh, for official purposes. Uh, but he's keeping a secret history the whole time, and it's all, it's all the dirt. And he's known for that. That's the thing that gets reprinted. But this is, uh, is, was his major work. He wrote an enormous work of military history uh, that's really, really good. It's, uh, it's, it's for the devo devotees only, but uh, if you love that period, you can't do without it. And I do, because uh, for a long time, I was working on uh, a novel. Uh, a historical novel about Belisarius. The, it's the only work of fiction that I've ever done that I've gone back to over and over again. 
but I felt the need to revise rather than simply abandon. Uh, and I, I don't think I'm still done with it. I, I don't know what it is. It's called Belisarius Out in the Dark Running. Uh, and I, I keep going back to it. <laughs> uh, but anyway, let's, uh, let's move on. What are we going to do next? We're still down in puppy territory. Uh, oh, look at this old thing. I don't know if you'll be able to read it in the light. This is uh, At Home, Abroad at Home by Julian Street, uh, which is a, it's from the early part of the 20th century, 1910 or 1914, something like that. Uh, and it's his, it's his voyages, it's his journeys. Uh, just, it's a collection of travel stories, but it's, it's travel stories from another era. Travel stories before electronic communication, before efficient. It, it, it's it's the old world of travel where where uh, the, the there's it's trains and it's ships <laughs> and it's long waits and it's long travel times. He did a a little book that I don't think I'll ever find. I loved it uh, called Shipboard, Ship B O R E D, uh, with the subtitle being Who Hasn't Been referring to, I think it was like 60 pages long. It was just a story about how bored you can be on a transatlantic voyage. What your ship bored. No one knows what that is anymore. People complain now if their transatlantic flight is delayed by 20 minutes. <laughs> when, when the time it takes you to fly from Boston to Hamburg is the time it would have taken you to get to Stellwagen Bank just off the coast of the shell of the North Atlantic shelf. <laughs> if you were traveling by ship, you just still had two weeks to go. Uh, but Julian Street's a wonderful storyteller. Oh God. Oh God. <laughs> She's followed us over here. Oh my God. Can't you ignore me for just a minute while I talk to my lame ass booktube friends? Hmm? Hmm? Why don't you ignore me for just a minute while I do that? Hmm? So what else have we got here? Uh, while we're down here in puppy territory, this is the uh, Cambridge Companion to John Dryden. Uh, it's a collection of, of essays and uh, factual summings up, and it's a perfect example of a book that I do not need. It's just sitting here. I love the look of it. I love the idea of it, but I bought it mainly to say that I'm a John Dryden fan. Well, what is what reason is that to buy a book, <laughs> much less to keep it on your bookshelf? It's insane. <laughs> Uh, but I'll be I'll be dealing with all of that. I have one more massive book sale uh, before the end of the year, uh, and uh, quite a bit of stuff is going to be dealt with then. Uh, so what have we got next? Let's do. Oh, 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 I don't know if I've recommended this on this channel before. This is Star Trek: Wagon Train to the Stars by Diane Carey. Uh, that is the Enterprise. Uh, no bloody A, B, C, or D. <laughs> that, is, that is the Enterprise under the command of Jap Captain James T. Kirk leading a convoy of, of vessels because this is a multi-part story. Diane Carey came up with the idea and she wrote the first book. And she gave the title, the, the mocking description that Gene Roddenberry used to use for his original Star Trek show when he was talking to network executives. They were saying, well, what is this? And he would say, it's kind of like Wagon Train to the Stars. Because Wagon Train was an old TV show that was mega popular. Uh, and the reason for the picture is because in the book, the Enterprise has been chosen with its marquee crew, all of whom have command grade now and could be elsewhere. They all decide to go on a year-long voyage as... Uh, Federation representative and starship heavy protection for a colonial expedition to a far distant world. A group of people, a group of settlers, a ragtag group, many, many different kinds of people who want to settle this world. And they're not particularly happy that they have a Starfleet escort. They don't consider themselves a military expedition at all. Uh, but Starfleet doesn't want to invest any kind of... It doesn't. Well, first of all, Starfleet doesn't want the bad press if something goes wrong. <laughs> they were sent out there unprotected and something goes wrong. It's a big, wild universe. Uh, but the glory of this book is that it allows Diane Carey to write about the, the original crew as incredibly seasoned professionals who have been working with each other forever. And she does that so well. <laughs> oh my god. If you are a, a fan of the original Star Trek, you have to read at least the first book in this series. There's one scene in the in Wagon Train to the Stars where the the ship the, the Enterprise is monitoring the whole fleet all around them, and all of a sudden there's an emergency with one of the other vessels, and the governor, the, the would be the future governor of the, of the colony, is on the bridge of the Enterprise talking to Captain Kirk about something else, and they don't want to alarm him, 
So purely using subtle body language, eye glances, the familiarity with each other born over ten de over two decades, they fix the problem. <laughs> they, 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 they get it fixed without any kind of talk about it at all to alarm the governor. It's amazing. Uh, so if, again, if you're a fan of the original Star Trek, you really have to read that book. And if you're not a fan of the original Star Trek, I want to get your life in order. Okay. Uh, but where, what, where, what, what does that leave us here? Oh, look at this. Oh, very nice. I think I showed this on this channel before. This is the great Raymond Chandler. This is uh, Trouble is My Business, <laughs> a collection of his hard-boiled gumshoe fiction that is so enjoyable, so good. Uh, oh, and we have, uh, what do we got for light here? I'm backlit here, right? So if I can see me, then you can see me, right? We have uh, Neverwhere by Neil Gaiman. Uh, this is a hardcover young adult with a naked cover, uh, artwork on the naked cover. Uh, hardcover YA novel of a, an author that I don't particularly like, uh, but I ended up liking it quite a bit. Uh, so it kind of surprised me. Uh, and what else we got here? We have a metal grasshopper <laughs> with movable legs uh, that I found on the sidewalk. So much of this stuff I found on the sidewalk. Uh, oh, look at this. Oh, there we go. We've seen this on this channel before, too. This is uh, The Dragon Riders of Pern, the great Michael Whelan cover artwork for the first three books. Isn't that wonderful? Hmm. A wonderful science fiction uh, science fiction series, also about uh, uh, an Earth-settled world. Uh, in this case, Pern, the world of Pern, whose settlers... Uh, find an indigenous species of small lizard, uh, proto-dragons, little things though, smaller than a puppy, uh, who seem to have the ability to phase in and out of reality. They seem to be able to wink and teleport, and no one can figure out why they would evolve such an ability until the colony has been there a while, and it turns out that uh, Pern has an, ex an eccentric neighbor, a neighbor in an eccentric orbit. And when that neighbor gets close enough, uh, so the gravitational fields mix, uh, spores from that neighboring world jump the distance and rain down on Pern. They're called Thread, and they eat everything. They destroy everything they touch. And that's why the dragons, have, uh, the little dragonettes, have evolved the ability to teleport, because it frees them. It, it allows them to escape Thread. Uh, and the, the colonists have to adapt in a hurry. They have to, they have to uh, genetically modify the little dragonettes into full-size dragons, who can also uh, jump in between, you know, who can also teleport, and who can therefore be used to combat Thread. <laughs> and Pern, the, the story, the original trilogy of Pern that Anne McCaffrey came up with is, is centuries and centuries later, when all of that is forgotten and has been subsumed into folklore. And it's just amazing. <laughs> what, what happens if the whole of society, if, what happens if that eccentric neighbor it's having an extremely eccentric orbit, long enough away so that the people of Pern forget what, per, what, what Thread is and no longer think that they should obey any of these old ritualistic precautions against it. What happens if they do that and they're not ready when it comes back? Uh, I, I, think that's, uh, <laughs> I think that's just great. Uh, I, haven't, I haven't looked at that collection in a long time, though. I really should. Uh, what have we got here? Oh, look at this. I think we saw this on this channel before. There, there he is. Look at that. Mm, hubba, hubba. This is the letters of the young Philip Sidney. A trove of letters of his was, was discovered. And the reason that this book looks the way it does, I don't know if you can tell, it's all, it's all warped and dented. And the reason for that is because uh, at, a couple of houses ago I had a fire. And uh, I had a wall of biographies, just like I do now, only three times the size. And the fire engine knocked out the front window and just poured water through that from the street. We were on the third floor. And so so for the course of 30 minutes, water was just pumping onto my biography shell. And I was away. I had actually, I was taking my first vacation out of state in 10 years uh, and heard about all this secondhand, came back to a pile of oatmeal that used to be treasured books, and I saved a few of them. There, this was one of the ones that I was able to save. It was on the periphery, so I was able to dry it off and fix it. Uh, and I, I got a lot of mileage out of that fire. For Fortunately, the people I lived with saved my beagles, 
Uh, but I, I told people the very first time that I go out of state for vacation in 10 years, my house burns down. So don't expect me to go anywhere again. <laughs> I have since then gone out of state, not on a vacation, never overnight. But uh, uh, but anyway, that uh, maybe that maybe that will do for now for grab and gab. Uh, we're at 15 minutes. That ought to be long enough. Uh, so I'm going to go see what uh, Frida is doing wrong. <laughs> uh, but I'll be back. Thank you, book two.